The first question comes from Dan, who writes in his, and he says, Since God knew before he created man that many would reject him and be destined for their chosen destination of hell, would he not have been better off not creating those people at all? That's a really good question. God knows what everyone would choose. So why didn't he just make people who would choose him and not bother make not bother pulling into existence the people who don't? Maybe not him, but those people would be better off uncreated anyway. Question mark. Dan, great question. It turns out there are several assumptions underneath this question. Uh, notice that a moral standard is assumed in this question. Uh, it, it's, it's making the case, at least in the question, it's implying that God is somehow immoral if he creates people he knew would go to hell. What, what being would do that? So, of course, the first thing Frank does is go to, what's your moral standard for judging God? And he was going to go on to talk about how Christians, how basically, if you're not a Christian, you have no basis for morality because, of course, only God can create objective morality. My position, of course, is that I don't think there is such a thing as objective morality. I think that once certain once goals are established like let's say your goal was to create the most terrible place to live well then you could establish a set of you could evaluate actions based on how well it accomplishes your goal of making a terrible place to live however thinking back to the magpie story i think that it makes natural evolutionary survival advantage sense that what a social species would value is decreasing group suffering and increasing group wellness. And of course, the larger the group, there's some tribalism, of course, and there's some selfishness, of course. But in general, the more you allow that group, the big picture group stuff to, to uh, take, drive your actions, the better off your morals will be. And that's, I think that is plenty enough to ground. But you know what? I don't like suffering. So I probably don't also want to suffer forever in the worst possible way that a all-knowing deity can come up with. That sounds terrible. Let me see. Do I need an objective standard to know that maybe that's not what I would want? And maybe if that's my destiny, that not being created would be better than facing that fate? I don't need an objective morality to figure that out. All I need to know is that I don't want to be tortured forever. Now, this presupposes a moral standard. It presupposes that it would be wrong to do such a thing. Okay, now, if this is coming from an atheist, you might ask the atheist who brings this up, by what moral standard are you claiming that this would be wrong for God to do, assuming that the objection is true? Yeah, copy and paste my previous rant in, into here. By what standard? Well, the standard that I think being tortured forever sounds bad. I don't want to, thanks. Now, if you're going to say that um, God is somehow immoral for creating people that he knows will go to hell... You have to have a standard, number one. Number two, you're assuming that going to hell is somehow unjust and that people who, who go to hell get more punishment than they deserve. No. No, Frank. I, the fact that, let's say that I fully deserve to go to hell. My actions are such that that is totally 100% what I deserve. What does that have to do with whether it's better or not that I would exist? Uh, it's still, let's, it's in fact, it's even more beneficial to everyone. If I've sinned enough that I should burn in hell, not creating me should be better for everyone. Or at least not negatively affecting everyone. 
why why is this great sinner needing to exist that's the fact that the person who goes to hell deserves it has no bearing frank on this question well why do you think that's true well it's eternal punishment frank isn't it wrong to have eternal punishment for a temporal sin well it depends on what you mean by that that's a really good question and that was one of the questions when i was deconstructing that loomed very large in case you missed it why does a finite crime deserve infinite punishment there's no way that scales it doesn't matter whether you uh, stole a paperclip or if you butchered thousands of people that's that's god's criteria for hell or not actually the criteria is whatever bad thing you did all of those things looking at a woman and a little bit too long is punish is sends you to hell if you don't accept the good gift so these things don't scale to infinite punishment that doesn't make any sense i guess i guess here here, here here's a couple of questions you might want to ask does the length of the punishment have to be congruent with the length of the time it took to commit the crime? No. No, the length of the punishment does not have to do with the length of the crime. For example, if, you, if it takes you two seconds to murder someone, should you only serve a sentence that, two, that is two seconds long? Yeah, that's the ridiculous example, of course, but that's not what we do in society. The punishment, if you're in a punitive punishment system for um, getting people to either act better or to serve as a deterrent for future people to not act in ways you don't want them to, you want the punishment to scale to the damage done, not to the length of time. So that, yeah, that doesn't make sense, right? Can't seem to put two and two together. So a murder is taking away every second of that person's life. So really, the, it's not how long it took. It's it's how many days of life you're taking away from people. And of course, the, the finality of it, uh, that's all baked into how long someone should suffer for a murder. Similarly, like we don't punish someone for stealing a chocolate bar to the same extent that you punish them for embezzling a million dollars although seemingly embezzling a million dollars doesn't always seem to get you bad crimes let's say stealing a car because that's more in line you get a greater punishment because you've done greater harm people frank that's why that's what morality is reducing suffering reducing harm increasing prosperity Er. well no obviously not the sentence is quite often much longer, usually always longer, than the length of the time it took you to commit the crime. Yeah. Except for um, back when they used to punish people for pirating music. That was that didn't take very long. Uh, well, no, I guess that would be another example. Forget that. Scratch that. That's a bad example. And a... Crime against an infinite being, an unending being, might require an unending punishment. No. This is where I go nuts. Okay. God, an infinite being, let's say you, you know, like you, you murdered someone here and you stole 50 years of their life. That's a pretty big deal because they only get so many years of life. If you could somehow steal 50 years of God's life, He's an infinite being. He doesn't even notice you stole that. That's not an infinite crime against God. That's an incredibly tiny crime against God. What can we possibly do to an all-powerful God? What crime can we do that hurts God in any way? We already know that God... Basic, you know, He didn't have to create. There's nothing we can do to Him. We are not in a position to hurt God at all. Uh, doesn't you go through the Ten Commandments? Like, I guess if you accept that God gets jealous, but an inf- how, how much can an infinite God get jealous of a finite creature? That's, this is just ridiculous. Again, the punishment goes to how much harm you do. 
So the most harm we can do is people who have very limited resources. If I was to steal $50 from your wallet, would that be the same as me stealing $50 from Jeff Bezos's wallet? Who probably doesn't have a wallet or 50s in it, but that's fine. Jeff would never notice, but you might. The punishment, frank argument that because God is an infinite being that we can hurt God infinitely is ridiculous. Not only that, but who says you stop sinning when you're in hell? You're who says you stop sinning when you're in hell? Because why not? You're continually against God, as Jesus said, this is a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what you're telling me is that what God expects me to do is go to hell, be punished with eternal conscious torment, but not sin about it. Don't have a bad attitude about it. He's looking for someone who's going to be singing some hymns and praising him. So that, can we get out of hell? Like if we're, if we have a good enough attitude about it, and if we're like really friendly to everyone in hell, are we, are we, is there like every three months do we get evaluated? This is ridiculous. I'm going to be staying, I'm going to stay in hell. I would have only been in hell one day if I had a good attitude, but I kept having a bad attitude that day. And Thursday I had a bad attitude, bad attitude. Friday I had a bad attitude. I'm just there forever because every day I'm grumbly. I don't get coffee. Of course I'm going to be grumbly. Which implies that you're still in rebellion against God. So the sins that you commit while you're here on earth continue in eternity, it seems, which might be the reason why the punishment continues. Which does not line up with the theology that a single sin is enough to warrant not going to heaven. It's not... The Bible doesn't teach that because we sin every day, that's the number of days we deserve to go to hell. The Bible says that if you committed one of those sins, that's it. You've broken the standard. It's not good enough. Frank's theology is falling apart all over. Regardless of any of that, since God is the very standard of justice, it would be impossible for him to be unjust in the afterlife circular argument. Because God is just, it would be impossible for him to not be just. So, just let's just all give him the benefit of the doubt that everything's going to be just, because by definition he is. So it's going to be great. But whatever those two destinations are, we know in one case, heaven, it will be grace, and in another case, hell, it will be justice. And that justice, by definition, since God is just, will be perfectly just. No. Trust me. I know you're burning there. And you think that the stuff you did in your 70, 80 years doesn't seem like you're maybe you're in year, you know, 6,006 in hell there. And you're like, hey, you know, I was only alive 80 years. Maybe, could we be done now? Have I done enough? No, no, because you, just trust me. God knows he doesn't have to explain himself. This is, this is just. Enjoy it, but have a good attitude about it, and maybe you'll get out of here. Or not, I don't know. Nobody will get more or less punishment than they deserve. Also, um, another assumption that people make when they say this is they assume that God can create free creatures who will always do what he wants. In other words, that God can create free creatures that always do what he wants. Frank is missing the point of the question. Point, the question asker did not ask, why can't God just make everyone sinless? The question asker astutely said, and maybe gave Frank too much credit here, asked, why is God going to create people who he knows will reject him? God, most people, Christians, theists, tend to believe that God has what's called middle knowledge, and that he knows all the, the answers in all the hypothetical situations. Like, let's say, 
like God knows what would happen to this stream if the power was to go out in 30 seconds. He also knows what would happen if uh, my dog was to scratch on the door in 30 seconds. He knows what all the possible things, how I, Paul Gia, would react. He knows all those various things. He knows every possible middle thing that could possibly happen. So God is going to know, and that's why they say God knows who is going to accept him and who's not. Because theoretically, the people who are going to accept him would accept him in a multitude of, of uh, possible scenarios. And those who will reject him will also be in a multitude of scenarios. I've even seen apologists say, you know what? God took all the people who are going to reject him anyway and put them like pre-Jesus era. Because why not? Because, you know, they're never, they don't need to hear about Jesus because even if they heard about him, they're going to reject him. Like, there's some weird contortion stuff like that going on in this whole middle knowledge area of God belief. Anyway. So Frank misses the point. Frank says, you can't create free creatures who are all going to accept God. I, sure, that's fine. But what God could have done, since he knew, was not create me, for example, knowing that I wasn't going to accept him. The world would have been fine without me. God could have easily arranged it so that my kids still happened somehow, if he wanted, if that's something that was supposed to happen, or that the things I was supposed to accomplish in my life that other people could pick up the slack or maybe that didn't even need to happen because we were arranging it so that none of the non-believers were going to be here. God could have created a world where none of the non-believers were here. Not a problem. Not a logical contradiction. When you say, why does God create people he knew would go to hell? You're almost saying, well, why doesn't God just create people who all go to heaven? No. That's not what, that's not what the question asker asked. That God, before the universe began, knew which people were going to accept and which we were going to reject. So just put the people on earth who were going to accept. No contradiction, no problem. Everyone's still free to do what they want. Well, if he could, he would. But if they're going to be free... No, because he could and he didn't. That's why we're asking. Creatures. In other words, they have the capacity to love... And that's why he gives us freedom. They can also have the capacity to hate or to reject. It might be that, you know, after God creates a few people, the, th the third or fourth one is, is definitely going to sin. Is therefore then God obligated to not create anything because some people freely decide not to follow him? Two things there. One is that it's not who's going to sin and who's not going to sin, right, Frank? Because it's who's going to accept the gift at the end and who's not going to accept the gift at the end. You don't have to create a sinless world in this scenario. You just have to create a world where everyone freely chooses to accept God's gift of forgiveness for the sins that they're going to do. So don't get off on a tangent there. That doesn't make sense. Second. That doesn't appear to me that God is obligated not to create. Right. Create nothing instead of something. I would argue... And again, going back to the magpies, going back to this whole thing about morality being reduction of harm and the encouragement of flourishing. I would argue that infinite harm for a lot of the creatures, in fact, the majority of the creatures, if you imagine humans, if you go by, you know, statistics over all of history, just probably the, num the number of people going to heaven is far smaller than the number of people going to hell because narrow is the way that leads to heaven. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. If we're doing math, the infinite suffering of a lot of people makes existence at all far worse than, hey, some lucky lottery winners got to experience something really great. So feel good about that while you're being tortured forever most of the people because some of the lucky people are having a really good time no that math doesn't work god should not have created if that's the way it works check my math tell me in the comments if i'm wrong but i think my math works on that eight because some reject god so 
You know, people say, well, God is all-powerful. Yes, he's all-powerful to do what is logically possible, but he's not all-powerful to do illogical things because logic is grounded in his nature and he can't contradict his nature. He can't create a square circle and he can't create free creatures whom he forces to do what he wants. Yeah, that's fine. We're not talking about the freedom or non-freedom of creatures, Frank. We're talking about God knowing what the free creatures will do and not making the ones who are going to have to be tortured forever. I hope my mic isn't make, getting too crazy loud. Frank makes me angry. This is what you guys don't normally see. Normally, I'm yelling at people on the street as I'm walking my dog. And by the time I script something and record something, I've calmed down. But not today. That's what you're going to get on Apology Live. If this is what you want, this is going to be the show for you, me being angry. So, yes, God could have created a universe where nobody existed, just a dead universe. He could have created no universe. He could have created a universe of robots, but that wouldn't be similar to ours either. I th but it would be cool. A universe of robots, that'd be pretty cool. What people are missing when they think about that question is they might not realize that everything is connected, that there is a ripple effect. That if you're listening to me right now and you're a believer, you wouldn't even be alive without atheists. You say, well, how can that be, Frank? Well, well I'm sure there are atheists or at least non-Christians in your bloodline, right? You wouldn't even be here without them. Right, Frank, but you are, a, in your mind, if you're a Christian, you are a soul. And that soul doesn't come from your DNA. That soul comes from some supernatural thing. Theoretically, that soul doesn't need to be attached to only your combination of mother and father DNA, right? That soul could have attached to different parents, the, the fertilization of a different egg. This doesn't follow. You're, you're, this isn't back to the future. You don't have to get your parents back together and make one an, make one an atheist or not. Uh, this is a non sequitur. And in fact, God can get his will done even by allowing people to be atheists. Again, we're not talking about God's will getting done because if God's, if God's will is that the most number of people will accept him, for example, then great, because that's the world we've created now where everyone who is born is the, of the type who will freely, freely choose to accept him. If God's will is that, uh, you know, the, the poor are fed, well... You can still have poor uh, in that system. Like, there's nothing that God might will that gets changed by never letting non-believers be born. Nothing. Or allowing people to do evil. For example, the famous atheist Richard Dawkins, he writes a book called The God Delusion. Dawkins is a great writer, but he's not a good philosopher. Nor is he particularly good at Twitter. Someone take his Twitter account away. In any event... Dawkins writes the book, a Christian picks it up and reads it and goes, oh, I hadn't heard that argument against God. And it causes the Christian to study more, to learn more about God as a result of what Richard Dawkins has written. So here's a case. Okay, so let me follow this, Frank. We have a Christian who was at strength level five or something. I don't know what your strength, the strength, Christian strength levels are. He's at five. He's at something. And by reading Richard Dawkins' book, he increased his level of God connection to six or eight or nine or whatever it is. Does that mean he's not safe? Because again, in this universe that we're wishing God would have done, everyone freely accepts him. So what does it matter how close the person is to God? They're still getting saved. But no, but we needed that person to have a couple of years of their lives, more close to God. So therefore, let's justify that Richard Dawkins, who will suffer eternal conscious torment, he needs to be born so that little Jimmy can go from five to six on the close to God scale. Like, is that supposed to make Richard Dawkins feel better when he's being tortured in hell? Really? where an atheist is doing what he wants to do, and it actually causes a Christian to become closer to God. 
There's a ripple effect there. So? Yes, God creates people he knows are going to go to hell, but they're freely going to hell on their own. And what they do actually all fits into God's plan. Yeah, but God can make a plan without them. Definitely can. He's all-powerful, right? That's not logically contradictory that whatever an atheist could have done, whatever good an atheist would have done towards God's will, a believer could have also done towards God's will, right? That's not contradictory. And the punishment that they get is absolutely perfect. The punishment they get is absolutely perfect. It's, it's good that they were born and had that punishment. Perfect. No more, no less than what they should get, even if we don't completely understand it. And of course we won't. We're finite creatures. There's one other thing. That's the escape, right? Well, God works in mysterious ways. And it doesn't make sense. But God says so, so just roll with it, right? Everyone's cool. He's perfectly just. We said so. So it'll be just. We're good. And I think this moral objection brings up, and that is it assumes that you could compare something with nothing. Existing and going to hell cannot be compared with not existing because not existing is nothing. Existing and not existing cannot be compared because one is nothing? Of course we can compare them. Um, like, let's say, for example, that there were people who were going to meet and have kids, and one of them got in an accident, and therefore their kids were never born. I can connect, compare those things, a thing that happened and a thing that didn't happen. That's, we can compare them. I mean, you can compare, you can compare apples and oranges. They're both fruit, but you can't compare apples to nothing. <laughs> yes, I can I could, let's, let's say that I pack my lunch and I normally include an apple. And one day I don't, I don't pack an apple. I, I get to work and there's no, no apple in my lunch. I can compare that to the day before when I had an apple. Pretty easy. Just like it's pretty easy for me to imagine. And, and it'll be really certain when I'm being eternally consciously tormented. That, you know, it's, you know what? I'm... Maybe me being born wasn't worth it in year 58,612 of being tortured. Like, you know what? That, the, the, the 80 years I had on Earth, that, that wasn't worth it. I, I can compare that not being here would be better than being here. I've been to parties where that's true. I've definitely been to stores where that's true. I can imagine, hey, you know what? What if I hadn't have come to Costco on Saturday? That would have been pretty great. This argument's stupid, Frank. Because there's nothing to compare. So technically, it's not appropriate to say, or it's not philosophically sound, it's not a good question to say, would it have been better off for, for these people not to have been created? Of course it would. Of course it's philosophically sound to ask the question. That's what philosophy's for, is to ask questions exactly like that. Questions of existence. That's what it's for. Would it be better to not be born than to be tortured forever? Some people would, are fine with, you know what, whatever happens in their 80, 100 years here, cool, that was definitely worth it. And I, what I did here, totally worth all the torture. But some people, maybe not. You know, there's, there's a, a lot of people throughout history who had really terrible lives. A lot of uh, kids who never heard of Jesus died of starvation. Would it not have been better that that person had never been born if what on top of that, on top of their terrible experience here, they're tortured forever? Can't imagine comparing those things, Frank. I'm sorry, everyone. This sucks. Because non-existence can't be compared to existence. All right. Now, I know that's a philosophical point, but it also is one way to understand this question. At the end of the day, we know that God is going to be completely just to people who 
do not accept his free gift of salvation, and he's going to be gracious to those that do. Neat. So again, you're affirming, Frank, and that was the end of the clip, by the way. Frank is affirming that the people who accept the gift of salvation will be getting a reward that they didn't earn, and everyone else has to suffer. Now, maybe they earned it. Okay, fine. But it still would be better for that person not to be born. And I would also argue, discuss amongst yourselves, discuss with your family and friends. But should God have created it all, given that most of the humans will end up in eternal conscious torment, and a tiny fraction will be in this glorious heaven? What do you think? Discuss amongst yourselves? Let me know in the comments.